Hey, we're live for another MMA. No, not MMA this time. It's uh, kick fighting. Kick or, or, kickbox, kickboxing. So a, a fairly new sport, I think. Um, we're covering. Uh, we're here for a kickboxing viv section. I'm joined by John O'Regan, our one of our esteemed kickboxing coverage people over at Bloody Elbow, to talk about the Glory 19 card taking place this Friday, February 6th, in uh, Hampton, Virginia. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I'm admittedly, I cover MMA mostly. I'm a very in the bubble person. I watch a couple of kickboxing cards here and there. I, I recognize the sport when I see it. I'm not like, oh, what are they doing? You know, what what part of MMA is this? Right. But uh, <laughs> um, t tell me a little bit about this card because I'm, you know, I've just kind of glanced over it. Uh, about the card, okay. Uh, so in the headline slot, you've got um, a world heavyweight championship match. The uh, the heavyweight title is on the line. Uh, Rico Verhoeven won the belt last year. Uh, he beat Daniel Gita in Los Angeles, uh, and he's defending the belt tomorrow night against uh, Errol Zimmerman. And he and Zimmerman both Dutch, but they're from different parts of Holland. They're from different gyms. Uh, they come from very different backgrounds, both training-wise and you know. Yeah. geographically, socially, um, and they are bitter, bitter rivals. They don't like each other one bit. They fought twice before. They're one one against each other. So this is a title fight, and it's a rivalry, and it's a rubber match. It's a very compelling fight. It could end in the first round. It could end in the fifth. Who knows? Uh, Co-main event. You've got Joe Schilling. You know, um, kickboxers, kickboxing fans know him. Uh, a lot of MMA fans now will know him because he stopped Melvin Manhoff in uh, his Bellator debut recently. Uh, Schilling's been on a tear since he joined Glory. He he won the first middleweight championship tournament, Glory 10. He was runner-up in the last man standing tournament uh, in June last year. He's uh, he's number one in the contender listings. Uh, Russia's Artem Levin is the champion now. Uh, you know Schilling's right there <clears throat> on the edge of a title shot. And uh, Friday night he faces Robert Thomas of Canada. Thomas is uh, is young. He's a prospect. He's a Muay Thai stylist, so uh, a similar kind of style to Schilling. Although uh, he's less experienced in kickboxing, uh, which I think is going to be a big factor, but we will get into that later. And uh, rounding out the card on Spike TV, then you've got a four-man welterweight contender tournament, and the winner of that tournament will go forward to fight uh, Bazooka Joel Valtellini for the welterweight championship later this year. In the tournament, you've got uh, Nicky the Natural Holskin. He's uh, currently ranked number one in the contender listings anyway, uh, and he's the favourite to win. Very, very experienced, uh, very technical, very powerful uh, Dutch kickboxer. Uh, he's facing Alexander Stetsarenko of Russia, who is ostensibly a Muay Thai stylist, but he's uh, an unusually brawling type forward pressure guy, you know, whereas Thai stylists traditionally would be a bit more technical. Uh, in the other bracket, you've got Raymond, real deal Daniels, uh, karate stylist from Los Angeles. A lot of guys will know him. He was in uh, Chuck Norris's World Combat League. He, uh, I think he fought in Strike Force a couple of times. There's a video of him. There's the huge numbers on YouTube from his knockout of uh, Francois Ambang when he hit that two-touch spinning heel kick. I think it's done about three quarters of a million views, maybe more. Um, you know, so he's had uh, quite a lot of hype on social media and, and stuff like that. He's facing Jonathan Oliveira, who comes from Brazil. He's from Curitiba, which is the same place that gave us Vanderlei Silva, Anderson Silva, you know, Shogun Hua. He's in that same kind of uh, striking tradition, and he actually trains at Shooty Box in Curitiba, and he does a lot of his training camps in Holland, where he trains at Hemmer's Gym, which is the former home of Alistair Overeem, Golkan Saki, um, you know, loads and loads of... So, uh, so Right off the bat, I'm thinking that Johnson Oliveira has got to be the big favorite to win win the whole thing, right? No, because he's not. No, he's not. Um, he's not so experienced. Like he's he's had two fights in Glory. He's two and all. He won them both by decision. Uh, so at this international top level, you know, he's still quite a newcomer. Yeah. Um, Holskin is by far the favorite. You know. Yeah, but uh, yeah. I. Uh, so you know, it's uh, it looks like a pretty strong card overall. I mean, that's the thing. I think you know, it, we, when you have a tournament, that's always exciting, especially like mm. a one night deal. And then on top of that, you got a couple of big fights that have very familiar names in them. So yeah, I mean, there's um, if you want to use the word storylines, you know, some great storylines uh, running through this card. The heavyweight title fight. Obviously, anytime that you get two genuine rivals who really don't like each other. 
Um, that always makes for an interesting fight. I'm in Virginia now. It's uh, it's 3 p.m. local time, and in one hour they're going to do the weigh-ins. And I've heard discussions already with some of the glory staff. They're talking about who they're going to have position to get in between Rico and Errol when they do the face-off because the tension, you, you could cut it with a knife. Uh, when they're walking past each other in the lobby and stuff, there's a lot of you know tension and, and uh, um, hostility in the air. In the tournament, Nicky Holscrum, he uh, he won the Glory 13 welterweight tournament uh, in December 2013, and mm -hmm. he actually knocked out Joe Valtellini in the final. So he considers himself the rightful champion, but right after he won that tournament, he was in a car accident, so he had to take most of 2014 off. In the meantime, Joe Valtellini went and won the title. So Hoskins has been talking all kinds of shit about Joe, and um, he's really taking it very, very personally that Joe has had the temerity to go and win the belt whilst Hoskins has been sidelined. Uh, you know, and he's using that... Um, that bitterness and that frustration to fuel his training camp. His training camp was at the Black Zillions, by the way. He's been training mm -hmm. down there with uh, Pedro Diaz and um, you know Tyrone Spong was around. Um, Johnson, Andy Johnson, some of those guys. So they've been kind of training techniques and stuff backwards and forwards. He's had a really good camp and uh, he looks fit. So uh, you know that's interesting to see how he's going to come back off that ring rust. Um, what else? Raymond Daniels, you know. Yeah. See if he can pull that off again. He's had two. Show-stopping knockouts in glory. Uh, his debut was uh, Brian Foster. He finished him with a, a spinning heel kick. And obviously when he beat Ambang, he uh, he topped that by doing a flying spinning heel kick. So this time I think he's probably going to have to do like a triple somersault off a trapeze, dressed as a ninja, flying. I actually I know actually he's been working on a... Because uh, I walked into his training session a couple of nights ago. He's been working on a jumping spinning knee. Where he like he level changes, hits a jab to the body to bring the guy's hands down, and then jumps up and spins and hits him with a knee to the head, which is just ridiculous, you know. So yeah, um, if, he, if he lands that, I'm gonna lose my mind. <laughs> so all right, I mean, it's on, the, the the main card's pretty stacked. Uh, the undercard, mm. I mean, I even recognize some names on the main card. The, the undercard, the only guy I really recognize is Andy Reesty, and um. Yeah. You know, I, I know we did. You, you ran a feature on Steve Moxon as well, mm -hmm. so obviously I, I've at least heard that name. But um, yeah, what 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 should we be watching out for on the undercard? What are the, what are the good fights? What are the fights to really be looking out for? Okay, so Risty Risty's a list. Like for people who don't know Andy Risty, he um, he's from Suriname, which is the same place that gave us Tyrone Spong. Uh, he. He made the headlines in the kickboxing world. He, he really um, shot to fame in, I want to say, November 2013. He was in the four-man uh, lightweight tournament in Glory 12, New York. Uh, Giorgio Petrosian, you know, some people might know that Petrosian is considered basically both the pound-for-pound -pound best currently right now and probably also the greatest of all time. Uh, up to that point, he'd only ever lost one fight out of, like, 90 professional fights, and even that one fight he reckoned was because uh, a promoter in Thailand poisoned him with uh, unclean water <clears throat> to give him diarrhea before he fought a local champion. Um, so Petrosian was by far the favourite uh, to win that tournament, and he went in to fight Risty, and uh, Risty knocked him out in the second round, and then Risty went to the final, and he knocked out Robin Van Roosmalen, who was the second favourite. Mm -hmm. I think that was in the first or second round. So he knocked out both those guys back-to-back -back in one night, which was just unbelievable. You could have heard a pin drop when he knocked out Petrosian. Um, Floyd Mayweather was in the audience, and the commentators were talking about uh, Petrosian being the Mayweather of kickboxing, and I think right after they said that, Risty <laughs> knocked him out with his trademark. He, he does this. Risty's really... Like, he's a southpaw, but I call him a weird paw because he, he's just so unorthodox. His timing and his rhythm is really weird, and his trademark shot is this... It's like a left hook uppercut like a sort of shovely uppercut hook thing it comes mm -hmm. at this weird angle like if you watch what he does he likes to kind of hit this jab and bring a guy's hand forward to protect the jab and then he comes with it and it's a really powerful shot he hits really hard uh, so, so Risty's A-list he's headlining the Super Fight Series card the reason being uh, they've just announced I think about an hour ago that the Super Fight Series uh, CBS Sports Network has picked it up in the US okay so, so I, I was going to ask how, like, can we watch that even it's yeah like there's an online stream pay-per-view, uh, which is the Super Fight Series and the Glory 19 main card. But in the US, I think it's going to be geo-blocked because the, the, the main card is on Spike and the Super Fight Series is going to wear on CBS Sports. I want to say a week from now on Sunday night. I haven't got the no. details. Um, That's well, people who want, want to find it, you know, it, it will be out there. Um, and yeah. it's definitely worth watching. Uh, he's fighting Steve Moxon. 
Moxon is, I like a miniature Tyson. He's a short, stocky guy. Um, you know, throws big, powerful hooks. He throws bombs. Moxon, there's no secret about his game. He needs to get close. He needs to be told to someone to start hitting these big hooks. Uh, he's fought some big names. He fought Wakao recently. Wakao's a name mm-hmm. that people might know. Um, Wakao beat him, took him the distance, which is respectable, going the distance yeah. against, against Wakao. Um, he gave him some problems with knees. Uh, and then Moxon fought, on his last fight, he fought Ike Pratchett. Mia Thonin, who some might know, some might not, but he's another good tie. Uh, he was also signed to Glory, actually. But this was this was a non-Glory fight. And uh, Ike Pratchett was giving him a lot of problems all through the fight. And then I think in the last sort of 10, 20 seconds, Moxon just hit one of those bombs and knocked him out. So, um, Risty is the massive favourite in this fight, but you can never rule Moxon out. He is a one-punch killer. Yeah, I mean, I but I have to assume you're... So Moxon does have a punch's chance, at very least. Oh, right? oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Like, if Moxon... If Moxon lands his left hook or his overhand right, then you're probably going to wake up for a week on Wednesday. Would you actually, like... I mean, I don't know what the odds are on this. Let me see if I can find them. Um, I'd be interested to know, actually, yeah. That's always a good thing to know, and uh, they might have them for that up, but best fight odds. No. Uh, let me see. Glory. Chris is a huge favorite. Um... But if I had like a probably spare, if I was making my bets and I had a spare ten bucks, I'd throw it on Moston to knock someone out. And yeah, you think that that's like a. That'd I wouldn't, be a good... I wouldn't pick a round, but it'd be, it'd be worth a side. But if he does win, he's going to win by knockout. He's definitely not going to win on point. Yeah, that I I can see that. Um, anyway, yeah, I can't find odds, but oh well, <laughs> not worth the the time. So um. Any other fights on the undercard? I mean, that's the first one we've kind of lit on. Yeah. But... So that was like the. Um, actually, they go nuts when you call it an undercard. I keep making that mistake because they say it's two separate television products. Yeah, well, whatever. It's an yeah, undercard. Anyway, I mean, it's just well, the easiest way to talk about it. And, and let's face it, you you know how how many of these fights on this under this super fight series second TV card? Are, like, it, it's obviously not the same product as the main card. Like, uh, no, actually, this is unusually, if you like, if you look at Super Fight Series cards on previous events, they for people who were into kickboxing, they've had some, you know... Yeah, some, but, like, this one... Which is ironic, really. Yeah. Yeah, because um, they used to release the fights free through the YouTube channel. I think there was a few countries that used to get a TV broadcast, but most of it went on uh, on YouTube on tape delay, like, a few days afterwards. Anyway, um, the other fight to watch is there's a young Canadian by the name of Josh Jauncey. And um, Josh is 21. He's 2-0 and in glory. He's looked amazing. He debuted against a guy called Warren Stevelmans. Was it in November last year? November, October? I'd have to look it up. But it was fairly recently. Uh, no, I tell you that. It was in May. It was in Denver. It was in May last year. And uh, Stevelmans has probably had about 100 fights. J- Stevelmans is a journeyman gatekeeper. You know, If you can hang with him or beat him, then you're, you're in that sort of top 15, 20 range. Uh, Johnson got knocked down in the first round, but then that kind of shook his nerves off for him, and he came back and he beat the brakes off Stephen. Great fight. And then um, his follow-up fight was in Oklahoma, November, glory 18. He fought uh, Jay Gilno, South Korea. He uh, he has some K1 Max fights and stuff. He's an experienced guy, and uh, leathered him. You know, put on an absolute clinic. He's super athletic, aggressive, hits hard, great hands, great movement. Kicks, knees, very, very complete game. He actually, uh, he's been a sometimes sparring partner of Jose Aldo because Jose Aldo um, often goes to Amsterdam to do training camps just in striking with Andy Sauer, who's a former K1 Max champion. Um, and Andy Sauer used to be with Majero Gym, which is a very famous gym in the kickboxing world, before he left and formed his own team. And Jose used to go to Majero to train with Andy. And um, Jauncey, who was originally trained by his father when he was a kid in his teenage years, he would spend his uh, his summer holidays from school. He would travel to Amsterdam as a teenager, which my parents would never have let me do, by the way. You know. Well, why not? I mean, come on, like you. John's is a clean cut kind of character, so he was uh, he was going there for the kickboxing, and he would go and train with Andy Sauer every day. You know, 15, 16 years of age, which is just insane. Um, so he's no stranger to top level talents and um, you know, hard hitting training rooms. Anyone who knows anything about Dutch kickboxing, like the sparring, is probably harder than the fight. Um, so he's crossed back to some big names already. Sauer, Aldo, you know, he doesn't get starstruck. Mm-hmm. Nerves aren't an issue. And uh, when you watch him fight, even just watching him watch at the ring, he looks like he's born to do it. He's got everything. He's got the look. He's articulate. He's intelligent. He's got the skill, the athleticism. I think he's, he's going to go really, really far. He's facing a guy 
called Max Baumert from Germany, and uh, Max is a product of uh, it's actually a Golden Glory affiliate, but like in Europe, there's loads of Golden Glory affiliates. Um, Max's main strength is probably actually boxing. He's had a lot of professional boxing experience, dangerous hands. And uh, Max fought Andy Sauer, who is one of John's coaches, in October last year and got stopped in the second round. So Max would. Uh, are we allowed to swear on this? Yeah, I don't care. Yeah, okay, so Max, is, uh, Max would very much like to deliver a fuck you to Andy Sauer by uh, stopping his protege. On Friday night, so that's going to be interesting. I don't think you're on internet TV. This is not like <laughs> you know yeah, we're not going to like bleep you or anything. <laughs> this is no, you know, I, I, we we would like you to refrain from like exposing yourself. That would be nice if you could like keep it, you know, from that. But beyond that, I'm not really concerned. Yeah, I won't expose myself on this, but um, I'll give out my PayPal later and email if anyone wants to, you know, arrange. Yeah, we can pay, we can do that show a whole like yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. You know. A, a whole calendar of Man of Bloody Elbow later. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what a treat. That's not, uh, that's, nobody's buying that. Let's We're never do that. Calendar. Don't ask. Let's never do that. Um, uh, okay. So, is, does Baumer, like, does he have a good shot against John C? I mean, are you just looking at this as, like, this is a quality test that John C should pass? Oh, I would say... I would say quality test he should pass is probably a good way to phrase it, but um, he's got dangerous hands, professional boxing experience at a decent level. Mm -hmm. You know, he's not fighting knockovers. Germany's got a strong professional yeah. boxing scene. Um, certainly, I think a big danger, I, I would expect Chauncey to win, but I think a big danger if Chauncey starts to take his eye off the ball or to coast. You know, any, any, any lapse in concentration might cost him daily. Uh, and the thing with Max you have to watch is when you pressure him, and he's covering up and stuff, you know, he explodes out of that shell and you can get caught with something there. So, um, Chauncey's right. going gonna, gonna to have to maintain his concentration and I think that, I think there's so many people expecting something spectacular from him. You know, you, you could maybe feel that pressure to like pull off a special move or, if, you know, like, mm -hmm. like I lost it against Fido, oh, I'll try a flying knee, you know, and that cost him. And, um, that might be a risk. Uh, but he seems a pretty level-headed guy, so I'd be surprised if he did that. But he's only 21, and I know when I was 21, I was an idiot. You know, every 21 year, <laughs> every 21 year old has got like a inner idiot just there uh, somewhere going, "No, let's do something different." Yeah, yeah, it's, well, it's an it's interesting fight. Always and a it, risk, especially if he uh, if he wins this fight, I think that he officially cracks the top 10 of the lightweight rankings. You know, which are, uh, that would be pretty age. huge. For that would be pretty huge, yeah, for a 21 year old and for a Canadian. And actually. Um, you know, Canadian kid. As much as Glory has been trying to penetrate the U.S. market and find American talent, I think that one of the big stories has been the emergence of uh, uh, Canada as a power. You know, um, mm -hmm. the the welterweight championship is in Canada, in Toronto, with Joe Vartellini. You know, uh, Gabriel Varga uh, at Glory 20 in April will be fighting for the vacant featherweight belt against Mosab Amrani, who's really good. But so is Gabriel. Uh, and then Josh Johnson, you know, um, is emerging as a solid prospect. Uh, Simon Marcus, obviously, is a big name in the Muay Thai world anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, he's up there. Uh, I'm trying to think of us. Well, let, let's move on to the... I digress, yeah. Yeah, the, yeah, the welterweight contender tournament. Because that's... Uh, I mean, unless there's anybody else on the undercard that you're no. really, like, jonesing over. No, the rest of it, I would say, is probably quite developmental. The only the names yeah. that people might know, if anybody saw that Pat Barry recently had a kickboxing match on the Legacy Show, I guess mm. the guy called Demorio Dennis. Demorio's brother, Myron Dennis, is on I the card. And uh, Xavier Vigny, if anybody watched the UFC countdown shows, you saw Nick Diaz training with Joe Schilling. Mm. Uh, and if you watch where they're talking about Diaz bringing in kickboxers for training, you can see at one point he's sparring with a, a big heavyweight guy who's kind of doing a lot of lean back head movement. That's Xavier Vigny. Uh, he's from California. He's good. He's worth All watching. Right, cool. Vigny might be, I think you're probably going to see over the next, over the course of this year, Vigny's probably going to climb up the card, I expect. Worth 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 looking out for then when this thing when it all airs or however you can find it in the meantime until it airs yeah. whatever. Uh, always good to watch out for those kind of guys. So let's talk about the welterweight tournament um, series here. As we already said, uh, Holskin's kind of the big favorite going in, and mm -hmm. honestly, for me, you know, with my untutored layman's eyes I watching tape it's obvious to me to see why I mean he seems like the one guy in the tournament who's both very you know athletic and 
like you know m- makes things look easy and has a very technical game to go with it. Yeah. Like the other guys there, you know, Daniels is really exciting. Oliveira is really aggressive. Setsarenko looks like he's got a nicely technical game, but Holtzkin's the one who's like everything clicks and you see a complete, you know, really polished fighter. Yeah, Holtzkin is. Um... Hoskins is like, if you were going to play a video game and you get to choose all different characters and mm-hmm. there's always that one character your friend always picks him and you go, oh, don't pick him he always wins, you know, he's too powerful that that would um, probably be Hoskins in the video game of kickboxing because he, he, like you say, he's got everything, you know, he's got um, speed, power, athleticism ruthless killer instinct uh, intelligence with, it, with his setups and stuff, great head movement which is unusual in kickboxing, they tend to be quite static, mm-hmm. they don't like to move their heads too much because the kicks yeah. come up at angles and stuff well, he's got more of a boxing background, so he's got good head movement, uh, footwork, which he also takes from his uh, his boxing training. Uh, fabulous hair, great tan, you know, <laughs> probably the best hair in professional kickboxing. Today. But you do not know how important that. I mean, fans, casual fans, they don't understand how important that is. No, I mean, I assume it's important just from watching how much time he spends on it. So, <laughs> uh, no, he's uh, he's he's the complete package, Nicky. You know, um, very very good. I mean, I mean, not only flex well on Valtellini as well, who. Uh, Held his own against him mm-hmm. the fight when they when they met in Tokyo. Um, but yeah, he's a very very complete package and uh, a huge fan favorite. People love watching Holskin. Um Trademark shot, left hand to the liver. You know, likes to sort of go high, bring the guy's hands up, hit that liver shot again. Quite a rare shot in uh, kickboxing and MMA. The the left hand to the liver is quite underused, but Holskin is a, a master at setting it up and finishing people with it. So uh, you know, look out for that. And um, just generally tight combination work, tight defense, tight offense. Yeah, if I was if I was going to pick any uh-huh. one hole in his game, I would say that perhaps he has a tendency, like a lot of the Dutch trained guys do, they tend to wait out when a guy's throwing a combination. They'll mm-hmm. shut up tight, and they'll wait till the guy finishes and then answer back. Like they don't break the combination. You know, they don't throw a disruptive shot halfway through. Um, so maybe something can be done with that, but. Um, yeah. I, I have to admit, I wasn't given a whole lot of confidence about Stetsarenko's ch- chances when I found the video of him losing to uh, Paul, Paul Daly. Daly. Which, yeah. I mean, I love Paul Daly. I'm a big Paul Daly fan. But, like, I mean, he's not a kickboxing great by any means. No, and yet I think that he... He probably could have done quite well if he had concentrated on because he, he he's drifted yeah. in and out of kickboxing MMA. Mm-hmm. Um, if he, if it would have been his full time focus, I would have been very interested to see you know what Daly would have done. I think Daly would have been big in Japan if they'd have had the weight class for him. Yeah. Um, you know, people love Daly. Daly's a finisher. He's got a good oh, kickboxing yeah. game. Daly's definitely a good kickboxer. Where he would mm-hmm. be, and actually, I know I was speaking to Daly about. Uh, like two, three weeks ago, in um, he was in London. Uh, Bellator were doing a press conference for this British Invasion show, and we got a sandwich and a coffee afterwards. And uh, he's actually signed to K1 right now, but I think that K1 can't give him the fights or something like that. And uh, he's mm-hmm. taking a look at his contract, and and he really wants to get into glory, which will be interesting in this in this weight class, you know. So yeah. that'll be interesting. Uh, but he took Stetsarenko out quickly. I mean, that's up to about 2012. Stetsarenko looked like a world beater. You know, he was. Um, he was on a really good run. I think he was undefeated in 2012, and then he he he, um, he went on a run of mixed results, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah. that was a quick knockout loss to Daly. You know, although getting knocked out by Paul Daly's left hook does put you in good company. It's happened before to some yeah. big name people, so it's not the you know it's nothing to be ashamed of, I guess. But it wasn't a good loss. It was a quick loss, and it was a pretty definitive loss. Um, Hoskin could repeat it. Mm-hmm. You know, you can't say that you couldn't. The problem with Stetsarenko, I think, is uh, it depends which Stetsarenko turns up on the day at the moment. He's talked about having uh, experienced burnout and mental pressures last year. And if you look at what he does, like he's a he's a police officer, he's a special operations police officer in Moscow, Russia, and he's also a guitarist in a semi-popular rock band in Russia. He is a snowboarder. He is what else does he do? He's re- oh he, he's doing two degrees. He's just finished a master's degree in business and he's about to finish his degree in law. He's just a ridiculous overachiever. Like yeah, and I, I got to say like my 
confidence in part-time fighters. And I hate to even say that because it's mm. like it, it's not a it, it feels like a worse term than it is. Mm. Because a lot of guys have to have a second job. I mean, you know, like not fighting doesn't pay well for everyone. But my, you know, my confidence in guys who take, you know, who have another full-time career outside mm-hmm. of fighting is mm-hmm. not high. I mean, it doesn't tend to breed consistency. No, there is, I know what you mean. There is definitely a difference between um, the guy who trains full-time pro, you know. I mean, some guys, there have been exceptions to the rule. Yeah. Uh, Shane Carwin, for example. Yeah. Uh, but no, I, I would agree with you, generally speaking. You would favor the full-time pro, although uh, Stetsarenko has had a rip- ridiculous amount of fights because he also yeah. is uh, pretty highly ranked in combat sambo which is you know uh-huh. um the, the the russian sport is quite similar to amateur mma or something i guess uh yeah. fedor emilenko's favorite sport and stuff uh he was on a reality show recently in russia with fedor actually him and mm-hmm. uh, they got some good airtime. he came across quite well apparently russian tv audiences liked him because uh, him and he's a very humble guy him mm. and fedor are quite similar they're quite quiet and they're quite humble um He's a good guy. He's the kind of guy that you know. I imagine girls would bring home to meet the parents and uh, stuff like that. He's a very wholesome guy, which is strange because when he gets in the ring, he hits a switch. You know, he's, he is super aggressive. Um, the finesse kind of goes out the window. He's a guy who likes to step forward and brawl. You know, just being that mm-hmm. short range. And one thing I think is interesting is that if Holskin doesn't finish him, the longer that you're in there with Stetsarenko, you're in there with a cheese grater who's just, you know hitting you and cutting you and banging you up so in a tournament that becomes important because Hoskin could end up absorbing quite a lot of damage and then going into that final pretty banged up. Yeah, so, I, mean, I, I would say that the one thing I did see watching Holskin a bit is that he's not like a really high output guy, he seems more no. like a guy who likes to sit on the outside and pick his Wait shot. For shot. Yeah. yeah. And against, I mean the the way that a lot of fighters take on, take on that kind of fighter is to get inside and really like Keep on them. Stay aggressive. Don't let them get the time to set up. Yeah, and so. that's where I, that's where I could see Hoskins taking damage. Like if I was if I was going to try and predict the future, I would say that it would probably play out something like that, where Hoskins is going to be you know moving and looking uh, for his shots, and uh, Stetsarenko is sort of pressuring him and throwing out volume. And I could see Hoskin getting banged up in the process of absorbing that and finding his shot. And then when he does find his shot, he will finish the fight. But it's probably yeah. just a question of how much damage he takes up to that yeah, point. It could be tough for the tournament. I mean, that's the kind of thing that you don't want to have in the opening round of yeah. the one tournament. I don't know. I mean, certainly, if I'm Raymond Daniels or Jonathan Oliveira, you know, I'm hoping that Hoskin takes huge amounts of damage, yeah. goes the distance, you know, hoping that he loses if I'm Daniels or Oliveira. <laughs> yeah, I think well, that's... Yeah. So, so then uh, we have Raymond Daniels, Jonathan Oliveira. Um, mm-hmm. My early take would be I would be picking Daniels here just because I, at least what little I saw of Jonathan Oliveira was like impressive in that he's really aggressive, but I didn't see anything else that I was like, oh, and, you know, I would pick him against somebody else who's, you know, I thought, like I saw Raymond Daniels fight against um, oh, Brian Foster. Mm-hmm. And Foster's actually a pretty decent kickboxer. Not great, but, like, he's got a little technique and some power and all that. He's very aggressive. And Daniel seemed to handle that kind of opponent really well. And I'm not saying that Oliver is, like, a direct port to that, but it just seems like that's the kind of matchup that he does well in. Um, yeah. Well, I was talking to Daniels about this. When I flew from England to the States, I changed in uh, Atlanta and just before we took off someone came and sat in the seat in front of mine for the connecting flight, and it was Daniels, who'd just come in from L.A., uh, and we're down here in Virginia. So I was talking to him on the plane, and I was talking about, um, you know, the tournament and styles of opponents and how he deals with stuff, because uh, he fought Valtellini in that Tokyo tournament at Glory 13, and Valtellini was able to close him down. You see, a guy like Daniels, he likes to work at distance, mm-hmm. keep the guy where he, and he kind of herds you into position, and then creates that window of opportunity, yeah. and then you know, takes the shot. Um, and Valtellini shut him down close range, hammered him with leg kicks because uh, Daniels comes from karate which is uh, in karate competition they didn't allow low kicks and stuff so that was a new thing that he had to learn how to deal with um, so I was just talking about all that obviously if you're Oliveira you know, you've watched the Valtellini fight and you think okay I'm going to walk forward I'm going to close him down, hands, hands, low kick hands, hands, low kick and just do the, the Valtellini model Um but Daniels knows that Oliveira thinks that, so um, he says that he likes guys. If you take a stereotypical kickboxer, 
uh, like Oliveira, or that, that stereotypical aggressive forward pressure approach, you know what the guy's going to do. Mm-hmm. And I think if, if a guy like Daniels knows what you're about to do, then you're in the danger zone because he's setting you up for something. Well, and it's always, you know, it, it's never like the best idea to model your approach off something that a really, really, really good fighter did. It's mm. like, oh, here, you know, this world champion did this to beat this guy, so I'll replicate his approach. And it's, well, like, yeah. I guess it's, it's, it's just kind of a basic template. I think if you're facing yeah. a guy who, um, the same as when they used to bring professional boxers to K1, if, if you're facing a guy who isn't used to dealing with leg kicks, um, I don't know if you've ever taken a few leg yeah. kicks, but it's extremely debilitating. You get kicked in the leg a few times, it's horrendous. Uh, mm-hmm. So, you know, the basic template is bring his hands up and then kick his legs out, repeat. Yeah. So it's an obvious tactic, it might work. He might be yeah. able to do it. Who are you know. picking? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm picking Daniels. Um, right. I always see, see the things because I can see all different options. I don't like to commit myself. I know, I but that's what we're here for. We're here yeah, to yeah. No, I'm we're not here for you to, to, to you know wash around and be like, oh no, anything could happen. It's a fight, yeah. anything. And anything could happen, but a lot of things are but like likely right. to happen. Yeah, I think um if, if I was if I was gonna go to the bookmakers then I think I'll probably put my money on Daniels to score a stoppage. I don't really see I don't really see anything too unique or creative from uh, Oliveira that Daniels isn't going to be able to deal with. And I don't think that he's... I don't see the same speed that Valtellini's got. Like, Valtellini's leg kicks are ridiculously fast. Um, Oliveira doesn't have that speed. And I think <clears throat> when he throws his hand combinations and stuff, like he, he's a bit loose getting back into his defensive positions, leaves a lot of openings. Quite easy to read, I think. I don't think, that, uh, I don't think Daniels is going to have a problem picking up on his timing. That's another thing. When you face a guy like Daniels, you need to do as much as possible to stop him reading your patterns and reading mm-hmm. your timing because he's processing all of that and he's seeing, you know, what he's looking for is a pattern. Yeah. And once he's got the pattern, then he's going to find his positioning for whatever it is that he wants to do. So you've got to be quite um, non-sequential in the things you do as much as possible. Keep disrupting his, like, create a pattern and then break it. But I don't see Oliveira having that kind of game. Uh, he comes with Coratiba, which is the same as uh, you know Vanderlei's yeah. place. And like people would say that Vanderlei Silva is a striker, but when you watch Vanderlei fighting, he doesn't have that technical striking game. You know, he's very. Yeah, uh, he had more of it back, like early, but even then, it was never like highly refined. Like mm. Brad Vanderlei did actually set some things up and you know used some technique, but it was not like you, you know you couldn't stick him in a kickboxing ring and just say. I mean, it, I think you could. I think it'd be entertaining as fuck. I would love to watch Prime yeah. Vandley in a kickboxing ring. Would be amazing. It would. He would just smash his skeleton off the opponent until something broke on one of them. Um, but you would probably never download a Vandley Silver striking instruction. <laughs> no, no, you would. Especially yeah. not. Yeah, not later on. And yeah, it, yeah, that would be. It'd be like okay. So step one is be strong as hell. Step mm-hmm. two is Kill. knees in the clinch. Mm. Like I'm not really learning how to fight here. Yeah. I, I, um, there was a great quote from Vanderly years ago when they were asking about his, his mentality or whatever, and he said that um, as soon as he, he likes to let the guy hit him first, and as soon as he hits him, he's like, "How dare you hit Vanderly so?" But now you be punished, and that was it. And then he just go. I was speaking to Rafael Cordero as well, uh, who's his long-term coach, and he said that he's basically spent over a decade in the corner screaming at Vanderly to like slow down. And Van Lee just <laughs> the word that he says, and he's like, slow, 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 and Van Lee just steams in. But yeah. it worked for him, you know. Yeah, it worked. It, it made, but, him, uh, it made well, him a great, you know, one of the best fighters in the world for. Made him a millionaire. Yeah, that too. You know? And a fan favorite. But Oliver is more technical. Um, hmm. You know, he's not like a Van Lee replica or anything, but he isn't. Um, no one's ever going to call Oliver the Mayweather of kickboxing. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, so so then, Daniels. Well, Let's um, move move on to the uh, co-main event, if we want to call it that. Let me just say, to finish off the tournament, so I expect, I'm expect i expecting a Holskin uh, Daniels final, and I think that's going to be more interesting. It depends how banged up Holskin is going to be, mm-hmm. and Holskin is a guy who has the, the tactics and the intelligence not to hand openings to Daniels on a plate, you know? And Holskin is a guy who is fast enough to smash Daniels apart with leg kicks and stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, I, it seems to me like then you have like a matchup that 
you have two guys who are gonna who like to wait and find their specific shots and who mm-hmm. you know like to spend time on the outside. And at that point, it seems you know I I don't know like I would be more likely to bet on the more technical, more stable fighter like the guy who sets things up consistently. But but then it's a tournament and it depends. Yeah, and it also like damage rest. Sometimes unorthodox, unorthodox guys at distance are harder to read if you spend a lot of time on the outside because you're not, it's harder to see that setup that they're creating mm-hmm. than the more typical ones that everybody else is throwing at you. So could be an, it could be an interesting final. I, if that's think, yeah. I think it's, gonna be, it's definitely it's definitely worth watching. It's going to be interesting. So let's Call go to the main event: Schilling Thomas. I know we said you said early on Thomas is a young prospect. You know, looks mm-hmm. good. I kind of look at this, and I'm I, to me, it seems like a little bit of a squash match. And I'm not saying that like Thomas is bad, but he seems to not like. It seems like he has, you know, does everything Schilling does, but not nearly as well. And that's yeah, never I, a good sign for winning a fight. I think we can say that it would be a big surprise if Thomas took the win by any means at all. Which is not to say that Thomas isn't good or anything, but like you say, you know, Schilling is ranked in the number one um, contender listings for a reason. He's in that number one spot for a reason. You know, he's proved himself against guys like Levin and Simon Marcus mm-hmm. and stuff. Uh, you know, Schilling has lost before. But it's not like he doesn't yeah. have losses on his record. I think that the biggest danger to Schilling might be, you know, if he's thinking that it's a squash match and if his yeah. preparations haven't been particularly thorough. In this camp, he was uh, while he was in camp for this fight, he's also been running the striking for Nick Diaz's camp against Anderson Silva. So I guess he's been getting a lot of work in. Um, and I know, I know Diaz has had him out on like five, six, seven mile runs every day and things. He said he's never run as much in his life, but I, the weigh-ins are pretty soon now. I saw him yesterday; he was looking pretty big. I think he had about 20 pounds to cut, which is a mm. big cut. And Schilling's quite a big guy. Um, I think he's also going to massively outsize Robert Thomas on a night. You know, he's going to be stronger and stuff. Um, I assume his fitness is going to be pretty good. So, yeah, it's definitely Schilling's fight to lose. And I don't know. I think uh, I'd be surprised if Schilling doesn't win by a stoppage, if I'm honest. And uh, I'm yeah. also surprised that Robert Thomas has, has kind of taken this fight, really. I don't know. I think that he debuted against Artem Levin, which is like literally the hardest debut in the world for Glory, um, just before Levin won the tournament. And then he faced Mike Lemaire in November in Oklahoma. And he had problems with him for the first two rounds, and then he sort of found found his rhythm in the third, and he stopped him with a head kick. But one of the problems that Thomas has got is that he comes from Muay Thai competition, and he's quite an orthodox Muay Thai guy. And in Muay Thai, uh, the fights are five rounds, and it's customary. You throw the first round away, you just kind of feel each other out. There's no really <laughs> significant shots. So they start slow, whereas in kickboxing you've got three rounds of three minutes, and as soon as the referee says go, you need to be like, <clears throat> you know, pressing X, <clears throat> power shots, and uh, he's he needs to learn that. I don't know if this is the fight that I would have picked for him right now. You know, I think yeah, it seems like a, it seems like a really rough way to try to learn that. It's like we're gonna throw you in with the best guys, yeah. the most aggressive guys. Yeah. He's not Schilling isn't the guy that I would give to somebody who needs you know more experience. It's not a learning fight. Um, yeah. it, it, it's I mean fights like that where you just, if you just get brutalized like that's not going to help your confidence. That's not like you don't learn anything just by getting you know, beat to hell. I don't know you know because Robert Scott. I would say he, he's a quiet lad and he's a really nice lad. I like Robert. Really mm-hmm. really nice guy. Uh, and he's only young. I think he's only like twenty one or something. Yeah. But he um, definitely has a rock solid. Deep, deep confidence in himself. You oh, know, sure. I, I don't think he's, you know, if he loses, I don't think it's going to shake his, uh, shake his confidence in any kind of particularly long-term damaging way. I think he'll, he'll pick himself up and move on quite quickly. His debut, his first fight he ever had. He used to get into fights in school when he was about, you know, 13, 14, and his mother, I think, made him take up martial arts, and he joined this Muay Thai club. He used to play lacrosse, and then he joined a Muay Thai club, and he trained for about three weeks, and then he had his first fight, and it was in Mexico. And he was 14, and he fought a 25-year-old, and the 25-year-old beat the shit, as you would imagine. Yeah. Beat the shit out of him. Actually, if you go to Stephanie Daniels, uh, Crooklyn did a story with uh, Robert. I think yesterday, so it should be on Bloody Elbow now, or uh, you know, sometime soon. Mm-hmm. And she got Robert to send her a, a photograph of the poster from Mexico, and you can see this like 25-year-old Mexican guy, mm-hmm. and then Robert's this skinny little kid, 
uh, 14, 15 years old, and the Mexican dude beat the brakes off him like he said he really fucked him up. Um, and that was his first ever fight. You know, here he is today. So yeah. if that didn't crush his confidence, nothing will. That's if that's true. That that may be a pretty good sign for things to come for him. That even even if he takes a brutal ass whooping here, he'll be back to uh, you know get better and you know. Yeah, he's, he's got he's got a very efficient Muay Thai game. He does things like he scores. Yeah. If you watch what he does with his knees, he scores with the right knee to the body a lot. <laughs> but then in kickboxing, while he's doing that, he's getting punched in the face a lot. And then if you look at the difference in scoring in kick, kickboxing yeah. and Muay Thai. You know, they don't really score punches too highly in Muay Thai. No, I, I, that's one of those things I remember. I was I was watching a Muay Thai event with some people. Oh, and I, had, exactly. I was like the scoring expert, and they, it was like a gym full of kickboxing people and Muay Thai people. Yeah. And it, it was like this fundamental lack of understanding that, and especially you hear it even on commentary in the U.S., it's like punches aren't really scoring that well. Knees mm. and elbows will. Throws score a lot. Mm. Yeah. And yeah. like... Kicks, uh, the body kick, the rib kick. Yeah. And so, yeah. like, if you're watching a guy get boxed up in a Muay Thai bat, and you're like, "Oh, he's losing," it's like that's really not. Yeah. Not it's because going. it's because getting punched in the head doesn't hurt, as we all know. Yeah, of course. I mean, I think that we, I think that we've seen that proven time and again. I mean, I wonder if it's a legacy. Like gloves are a relatively new thing in Muay Thai. Mm-hmm. They're only introduced in like 1920 something. You know, and Muay Thai's got a thousand year history. So I wonder if. Back in the day, maybe they didn't punch very much, or they didn't punch very hard, so as not to break the hands. And yeah. Maybe the scoring has developed from that. You know, that could, punching, could easily be. Punching might have been ineffective back then. So. Well, and it's also the idea of you build rules to make the sport that you want to see. If you want to see knees and elbows and throws, and you don't want to see boxing. I don't know, you know, because I. I'm no Muay Thai expert, like he, not yeah. like say Kyle McLachlan, who, who also writes a bloody elbow, who. Um, you know, he's really deep into his Muay Thai mm-hmm. and all this stuff. But I, 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 I train Thai. I've done for years, and I, I love to watch it. Um, but if I was king for a day, certainly there were some big changes I would make to the rule set. And I've been to Thailand. I've been and watched shows in stadiums in Thailand, and the Thais go nuts when you get a kickboxing style fight. When you get two guys that are just like, "Fuck this," huh. just go out of the Thailand. Ah! Um, well, then, but, you know, there's just me spouting off about crap. No, it's, it's the gambling thing. Like Muay Thai is dominated yeah. by gambling, and gamblers like. To have fights that are very sort of easy for them to read and, and kind of predictable. Yeah. The gambling industry really controls Muay Thai to a huge extent in Thailand, so don't expect any changes anytime soon. Anyway, yes. that's all way off topic, and we're yeah, do that. Let's talk about Rico Verhoeven, Errol Zimmerman. They're one and one. My my quick and dirty okay. layman's read on this is that I am picking Verhoeven because he seems like the young fighter that's getting better every time out, and like really putting together a more technical game to match his physical gifts. And Zimmerman, you know, he's seems like the hard-hitting guy who's dangerous, but I wouldn't pick him fight fight to fight to, like, win this fight. If I had to watch this 100 times, I might pick him to win 30. You know, yeah. that kind of thing. Um, yeah, you've pretty much nailed it. So if you want to carry on, I've got some text and stuff to say. Uh, <laughs> no, you're right. He, I would say that Errol is the, the throwback to the big knockout brawler days of, I don't know, kickboxing or a fight game, whatever. He's that old-style heavyweight uh, puncher. And Rico is, you know, Rico's the, the, the very much the modern athlete, the kind of future of the sport. Rico is a guy who takes his nutrition seriously, his rest, his exercise, his strength and conditioning, flexibility. Uh, he, he treats himself as a professional athlete the same as if he was a soccer player or a, a football player or, mm-hmm. um, very much the modern face of it uh, and he plays an intelligent game you know. and then also he is uh, good looking, articulate charismatic um, and Errol is much more raw and <laughs> it's like, like not, not, that's going to help him in the fight but that's Oh, no, I just, I just think that it's very. Um, there's a lot of opposites in this fight. The like, yeah. you know, I would say like fire and ice. Rico is, is the sort of ice cold, cool character, uh, and Errol is very much the sort of fiery kind of uh, anger driven, emotional, mm. you know, kind of guy. Um, and then, like I say, Rico is the kind of modern sports science kind of guy. Errol is the sort of old school, you know, bar brawler kind of guy. Um, what else they um, they really don't like each other 
uh, it's a rubber match, it's a rivalry, um, but it just got very, very different approaches to the fight game. Like Errol has, has admitted frequently that he, he prefers the nightclub to the training room, you know. So mm -hmm. um, I hope I, I, I hope he's training properly for this fight because I was talking to one of his cornermen and I said, how was his training gone? And he went, eh. and I thought, mm, an unusual reaction for someone in the corner for a world championship fight, but okay. Uh, but he looks, uh, I don't know, he looks good. He shook my yeah. hand earlier and dislocated my shoulder, so he's definitely strong at the moment. Uh, and Rico's looking ripped and lean. Um, so it's, it's going to be an interesting fight. The criticism that everyone levels at Rico, obviously, is that he's a big guy uh, mm -hmm. and he's a heavyweight, but he doesn't have a huge amount of knockouts on his record. He, okay, he, he's not a knockout guy. Maybe he's not, but he's a very technical kickboxer. Uh, maybe he doesn't need to be a knockout guy. You know, he takes people apart. Well, it, it seemed to me like maybe he started with more of a clinch-heavy tie offense of, like, mixing in a lot of knees and kind of getting inside and putting together, like, good combinations with his feet to his hands, but not necessarily a great, like, technical boxer. That's mm. maybe something he's been working more on. And I mean, I could make knockouts how, happen more. How far but, back are you going? Uh, just couple years, not far. Right, because, so the first time these guys fought was in 2012, January, and uh, Rico knocked him out in about, I think, 45 seconds or something. Mm -hmm. Through that classic mechanism of bringing the guy's hands up and then through an uppercut up the middle, lifted his head, bang, yep. um, knocked him out, because if Errol lands a clean shot on you, mm -hmm. he's, you know, lights out. Uh, but in that, like, in, the, in the two year period up to now, um, there's an English heavyweight boxer by the name of Tyson Fury. Uh, I've never know. heard of him. Right, so Tyson's like, he's sort of getting on the edge of that contender picture. in, in Yeah, the yeah I, I, I know. Who he is, yeah. Oh, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Um, Sorry. <laughs> I, didn't know, I, don't, I don't know if you follow boxing or not. No, I, Tyson Fury is a hard man to ignore. Okay, yeah. So Tyson um, is actually from an Irish traveller background, like an Irish gypsy background. And uh, this has happened for years and years where like, Irish gypsies uh, like to fight among themselves for big cash bets. And mm -hmm. guys from the Irish gypsy community who are successful in boxing often find themselves like waking up one day and they have like a rival clan basically camped on the doorstep outside the house who, who force themselves like a bare knuckle fist fight or whatever. Uh, so Tyson relocated to the Netherlands a couple of years ago. He does a lot of his training camps and stuff out there. Like he's originally from Manchester where I'm from actually. But... Um, He's kind of back and forth between Manchester and uh, and the Netherlands, and he did his training camps at uh, the same gym as Rico, so they train together a lot. And Rico's boxing skill has, you know, massively improved. Like if you watch Rico fight now, his jab, you know, this, he never used to have a jab. He didn't know yeah. what a jab was, and you look at it now, and it's it's like a proper boxer's jab. The way that he uses it, um, so boxing has actually become one of his key strengths. I would say. Yeah, so that's, that's what I'm saying. Is it like it's something where you know people are criticizing him as not a knockout threat? Well, maybe that's you know that's something that comes as you develop your hands. Yeah, I just I, I don't really know what it is with him and knockouts, but I feel like when I watch him, when I watch him throw his hands, he reminds me of an amateur boxer or like an mm -hmm. Olympic, but you know where the kind of scoring for clean points gotcha. rather than uh, that big follow through knockout shot. Like he's he's quite sort of sharp and straight with a lot of what he throws. He's not a big hook swinger. Um. So he has got a, he's got a high volume as well, you know. So he, he yeah. has got a high point scoring, uh, point scoring style, and then defensively he's quite tight. But but he will be letting Zimmer, Zimmerman hang around for all three rounds. It sounds like at that point, like that is worth noting that or five rounds. Five rounds. Five rounds. Whatever. Whatever you do in this. Crazy. Well, then this is this is the other thing. Um, can Zimmerman can Zimmerman go five rounds? Yeah. Not in the in the past, and we've seen Zimmerman gas badly. Now, I would hope with this being a world championship fight that his training camp has been uh, thorough and that he's prepared for five rounds of high output. You know, but we've seen in the past that sometimes he isn't because Zimmerman uh, is probably one of the most naturally explosive, hard-hitting punchers in uh, all of fight sports. You know, MMA, mm -hmm. boxing, anything. He's a very, very, very hard hitter, and uh, it's the gift and the curse. You know, when you're so powerful, you don't need to train. Yeah, because uh, you can just knock a guy out. Like he's, well, I can't think when it was about 2000 and maybe 2009, 2010. There was an it Showtime show in the Netherlands, and uh, Errol was supposed to fight. I can't think who he was fighting, but um, a lot of Errol's friends were in the audience, and Errol disappeared, and the promoter was going mad because he couldn't find him, and they were trying to queue him up and say, "Look, you're on in like 30 minutes or whatever." 
and eventually they found him sitting in the crowd with his friends and he was like fully dressed just dressed normally having a coke and like talking to his friends and hanging out and uh, watching the fights and they said what are you doing you're supposed to be fighting in 30 minutes and he's gone yeah okay and he just walked in the back room took his stuff off didn't warm up stuck his gloves on walked out gave his friends a wave and then the fight started bang knocked the guy out and then just went and got changed again and went back and sat with his friends that's the kind of guy that he is you know he can, he's got that kind of power but also that has meant that because he knows he can do that sometimes when he's having one of those days where he's having to work out hard he can just think that you know he'll just leave it and, and go and do something more enjoyable like Errol, Errol actually is kind of frustrating for me because if he had trained properly from day one uh, he could have been one of the all time greats if he if he had that athlete's dedication that Rico has then um, he could have been one of the all time greats he's lost a lot of fights to people that had no business beating him so so what do you, what's your what, what would your odds be on him winning this fight <sighs> This one, I really can't pick him. And I, I've been asking people for predictions all week. Here and uh, ev everybody, when you ask them, they go, because it really is one of those. It's a team. Yeah. You can't ever like predict that one's going to... I don't even know, man. I can't, I'm not good at calculating odds. Um, well, like, that, that would be like a huge landslide underdog. Like, a landslide that's... underdog? No, oh, I wouldn't know, because Errol can finish a fight instantly at any moment, you know? Once you yeah. go past, once you go past the third round, generally I would imagine the chances of him losing power and explosiveness and starting to gas are probably quite high. <clears throat> so the the um, chance of the knockout probably becomes less. But certainly in that first two rounds, there's a, <laughs> a very very high risk. You know, really high risk. Mm -hmm. He can just come from anywhere. You can never discount him. So um, yeah, certainly yeah, can't really him out. You're not picking him to get that early knockout, are you? No, if I if I had a gun to my head and a hundred dollars to place a bet, I would uh, I would take Rico by decision after five rounds. But certainly within, right. within the first two rounds, especially, don't take your eyes off Zimmerman because he can just come from nowhere. Well, I, I gotta say, overall, I, I'm much more excited about this card than I was going in knowing very very little. It actually looks like a pretty good Jumped night of fights. Yeah, no, it's gonna be a great night of fights, you know. Um, Kickboxing fans, obviously, are already looking forward to it. Uh, if you're watching this and you're not a kickboxing fan, you know it's your first time, uh, maybe the first time you've taken an interest in a card, definitely tune in. Um, you'll love it. It's got kickboxing, the glory kickboxing especially, has got the, the highest percentage of knockouts of any combat sport out there. Like Most of these fights get finished, and when they do get finished, it tends to be in quite spectacular fashion, you know. And there's not a lot of messing around. You don't. There's no clinching on the fence. There's no like stalling on the floor. There's no takedowns or anything like that. Like these guys come out of the gate fast and they come out looking for the finish. All right. Well, cool. Thanks for thanks for joining me and going over this with me and breaking it all down for me. It was a good time. Yeah. We'll have um, to do it again for another kickboxing card. Yeah, sure. One way or another. Um, and uh, yeah. Um. You know. Until for then. Me. Yeah. No problem. Thanks for stopping by. So oh, and, you, wait. Wait, sorry. Go Hold on. up. Hold up. Can find we where can people find you? They can find you on Twitter. Where? Uh, you can find me on Twitter uh, at at John Joe O'Regan, all one word. At John and, Joe O'Regan. Find um, your bloody elbow, obviously. Yeah, you can find bloodyelbow.com. Yeah. Uh, you can you can find me at D Zane Simon on Bloody Elbow. If you're watching the video, give it a like. That's a thumbs up down below. Subscribe to MMANation.com. Go to Bloody Elbow, you know, send us positive messages and mm -hmm. all that money. We want money. Send us money. Money's nice. Send us money. Cakes. Yeah. And uh, thanks, everybody, for watching, and thanks for stopping by.